welcome to everybody who's here with us at the Georgetown Club for the Q&A Cafe and our audience at home. Uh, I just want to start by thanking a few people. I had to write it down because I have so many. I want to thank, first of all, all of you. And I want to thank the Georgetown Club for inviting us here. I want to thank Bo Blair and Christian Broder and the board for making it possible. I want to thank District Cable Network for putting us on the air every week and Georgetown Cupcakes for providing desserts. Hey, I told you it was a long list. And Washingtonian, my day job, for letting me have the day off. And especially you, Kojo Namdi, for giving me another chance. Because the last time we tried to do this, we kind I of- I blew up. We, we, we blew up the place. No, it wasn't here. <laughs> but it, it's so nice to um, have you back. And I must say that maybe it was serendipitous because interesting things have transpired and we're going to get to that that's not exactly where i'm going to start though because i wanted to start by thank thank thanking you and welcoming you to georgetown thank you because georgetown is a name that's important to you and where you're from that's where i grew up you grew up but not in this georgetown not in this georgetown i you grew up in georgetown guyana the capital city of what when I was born was called British Guiana yeah, I remember because that. we were a British colony. Yeah, yeah. Uh, your Georgetown's an actual capital. It has you could say it has statehood. Yeah. It and has because <laughs> because the legislators there are allowed to vote and it counts. And you left when you were how old? Twenty two. Twenty two. Yes. I'd lived a fairly full life into it was technically adulthood at the time, even though I was quite immature. Had you finished your education there? No, I'd only finished high school there. I mm. left, I was sent, mailed by my mother <laughs> to go to college at McGill University in, in Montreal, Canada. Canada. Yeah. Yeah. That's a lovely place. Yeah, and I mean mailed. I mean, I was working as an insurance salesman and I was doing rather well. And all of my friends who had finished high school, some of whom had finished college, were not financially doing as well as I was, so I saw absolutely no need to go to college. But my mother conspired with a friend who was at McGill and managed to get my transcripts, managed to get me admitted, oh, took away my big fancy motorcycle, uh -huh. and said, you're off to McGill, son. And, and, that was it. Um, and when you arrived there, uh, did you have any family, any friends? Did you just arrive in I had Montreal? An uncle, my mother had a brother who lived okay. in Montreal, Canada. So that helped. And for the first few weeks I stayed with him, but I had friends on campus, and mm -hmm. so I quickly moved into housing near campus and stayed there for the year that I spent at McGill. And are you the only one in your family to go off to college? No. My sister is a medical doctor, and she preceded me going to college by, ooh, six years or so, five or and six And was years. that part of the leverage that your mother had to get you to go to school, sort of like, see, your sister is, you know, on her way, you should do the same? Or did she just, I mean, was it just a mandate in the family that you should get a college education? Here's what happened. I came home from work one day. I had a passport because I had previously traveled around the Caribbean. My mother put into my hands the passport, mm -hmm. my admission to McGill University, mm -hmm. and my ticket to oh Montreal, God. Canada, <laughs> and said, Go. you are going to college. Yeah. There was no discussion, discussion of family tradition yeah. or anything else. Anything it was just, else. Here you go. Did she and think you'd come back to live there? We all did. But I thought four years. I'll graduate mm -hmm. from undergraduate school, and I'll be back to this life that I've grown to love so much. Mm -hmm. So what happened? It's been now, by my calculation, that was 1967. That would make this 47 years. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you didn't years. spend it, obviously, in Canada, so. <laughs> no, I, 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 after one year at McGill, I was a black militant in training. Mm -hmm. and at McGill, as with many college campuses across Canada and the United States at that time. What year are we talking about? 1967. Okay. Both the anti-war movement and Black Panthers. the Black Power movement, Black which had mm -hmm. kind of attracted youth out of the civil rights movement, mm -hmm. were taking place. And I was also an actor. I had done a few plays with the McGill players. And Did I you think that was where you were going? Yes, that was where I saw my career mm -hmm. going. Um, during my years between high school and college in Guyana, I joined 
two amateur theaters in Guyana. I had started acting in high school. Can I tell you how that started? I went to an all-male high school that was like a British public school, and it was the elite high school in Guyana, and they stage a play every year, usually the Shakespeare play, for which people who were preparing for the external examinations were studying. Okay. And so my first performance was in Julius Caesar. I was 11 years old. Oh my. It was an all-male school. I played Brutus's wife portion. <laughs> <laughs> because the British way. Invariably the younger kids in the high school had the higher pitched voices, mm -hmm. but I did eventually graduate to male roles. Your voice did eventually develop into a male voice. This was after playing Orinthia in the apple cart. <laughs> and then finally I was able to play Algernon Moncrief in The Importance of Being Earnest. By then I was ready to graduate high school. Do you remember your lines to this day? I mean, do they stay with we you? We went bunburying a lot mm. in The Importance of Being Earnest. Mm -hmm. it, I, I love that. Do you remember your Shakespeare? Can you just drop Shakespeare at a whim? Oh, of course. Let me have men about me that are fat, sleek-headed men and such that sleep o' nights. That's, that's good. That's good. Jan Cassius has a lean and hungry look. Such men are dangerous. But you didn't arrive in New York that way, did you? <laughs> no. By the time I arrived in New York, I had this big head of hair. Yeah. The you were requisite... A full, you were a full-blown you were a full -blown militant, the right? The requisite bush that one had to yeah, have well. in those days in 1967. I um, got a job on Wall Street as a clerk for a brokerage firm, and I, I made the mistake of starting to read L'Etranger by Albert Camus, mm -hmm. which was about a clerk and about existentialism, and saw myself in this character. Where were you living? I was living in Brooklyn at the time, first in Bedford-Stuyvesant. Mm -hmm. And then and that was the Brooklyn of then, not the Brooklyn of... Uh, you know, today. Of today, that yeah, like I couldn't afford to live there yeah, today. Yeah, right, exactly. Yeah. So like DC. Yeah. Then I lived in Ocean Hill, Brownsville, in the eastern part of Brooklyn. And so I was working in these clerical positions by day and hanging around in the village at night trying to get acting roles and the like. Right. And I discovered that when you hang around actors, you never get to sleep before four o'clock in the morning. But you were young, so... And I wasn't okay. getting anything accomplished. Yeah. And so I decided that in order to get something accomplished, I had to leave New York. And come to Washington. And come to Washington. Was militancy serving you? I mean, did you find it to be what you hoped it would be? Did you achieve your goals? Did it, was it meaningful for you? It stimulated me intellectually mm -hmm. because I was, I was beginning to read stuff that I hadn't read before. I was beginning to read authors that I hadn't read before. The only author I'd read in Guyana who had anything to do with race of the civil rights movement was James Baldwin. Mm -hmm. And I found that very inspirational. Did you ever get to meet him? I never actually got to yeah. meet him. It was one of the things it I seemed really in your career it would have been possible. <laughs> it was one of the things I wanted to do, but I never got that opportunity. So I came to Washington, enrolled at what was then Federal City College. Where was that? It was in what is now the shelter for the community for creative nonviolence at the corner of, I guess it's First and mm -hmm. East Streets Northwest. Yeah. That's where it was located in those days, and that's where we went to classes. But during that time, I was also pursuing this black militant career mm -hmm. as an activist on the side. And in that context, we had a drama group because we mm -hmm. felt that one of the more effective I guess methods of agitprop right, right, was to, was through street theater. Well, it's inclusive. Yes. You know that's that, that and, and there was so much more of it then. I mean, it wasn't just black militants; it was pretty much all militants Everybody, yes. using that. Yep. Theme. So we were doing street theater. We had a, a group at the time, and I started out as an actor in the group, and somehow ended up being the director of the group. And we were doing this, and I guess in the summer of maybe 1960, no, 1970. In the summer of 1970, we were approached by a radio station that was located just up the street from where we now sit on Wisconsin Avenue. Its call located. letters were? W-O-L. <laughs> it, it, it was then owned by the Sonderling Group. And in those days, commercial radio stations used to have a requirement for public affairs program mm -hmm. 
and of course they put it on the weekends when they thought nobody was listening, usually on yeah. Saturdays and Sunday yeah. nights. And it was an AM station, right? It was an Do AM station. Do you remember station? its call letters? Were they, all, were they the same call letters WOL had throughout its career? Yep, same call letters that they do have now, but during the week they played soul music. Mm -hmm. And then on weekends, because in those days radio stations, in order to fulfill their public affairs requirements, had to conduct something called ascertainment, which they had to go around the neighboring community, talk to residents, and find out what those residents were interested in, and then to include that in their public affairs programming. Of course, we can, we can see where that seed ended up. Exactly right. <laughs> <laughs> the FCC threw that out the window. Well, I'm talking just about you. you know well, that? that's the seed that sprouted my entire broadcasting career. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's. And, and to this day, each week, you do a community, you go out to the community and do a show. Coach in your community. Yeah, we did yeah, it yeah. during the course of the past week from the new headquarters of NPR on North Capitol Street in the Noma District, north of Massachusetts Avenue, mm -hmm. which some people think shouldn't be called that, but that's another yeah, story. That's what it is. <laughs> um, do you consider yourself still a militant, an agitator, an activist? Not really, because... One of the things that happened when I started doing <coughs> real news, as opposed to fake news, we... <laughs> You're we, saying that, I'm not. <laughs> no, I'll tell you how. We started out, um, the radio station called on us, asked us to do a, a dramatic children's performance, children's mm -hmm. plays. Mm -hmm. So for about a year, we, did a, a, we wrote and performed on the radio children's plays that mm -hmm. were... Um, trying to capture the history of the African-American experience. Right. And then after that, they, we worked cheap, as in for free. So they said, well, can't you do something else? And we said, sure, we can do a news magazine. We're actors. We can act like news people. And so we started doing a weekly news magazine. As I said. So you transitioned from infotainment to news, even though we didn't call it that back then. Exactly. And it was... Uh, a news program that had a large dose of activism in it. That's why I called it a fake news program, because we really were using the news program to try to convert people mm -hmm. to what our ideological orientation was mm -hmm. at that time. Mm -hmm. But it gave me, I didn't realize it, it gave me the training that I needed in writing for news and the training that I needed in being able to broadcast news. And so... Um, a few years later, when I was um, working as a sp freelance speech writer, because by then I could write. What is this now, the early 70s? This is the early 70s. Mm -hmm. I'm working as a freelance speech writer, writing speeches for a lot of conventions coming to town, the Urban League, the NAACP are coming it's to town. It's a good business, actually. Yeah. still is. And Where were you living? I was living in Northwest Washington mm -hmm. in the Shaw District mm -hmm. in Ward 1. Mm -hmm. And by then, I had twin sons. Mm -hmm. They were born in 1971. Mm -hmm. They were two years old. And it occurred to me that I needed a real job. That running around being an <laughs> that activist. Happens, that happens when children come along. <laughs> being in study groups and being an actor. Yeah, yeah. All of a sudden, I needed a real job. And so the Washington Post in 1971 was required by the Federal Communications Commission to divest itself of some of its commercial broadcasting mm -hmm. properties because in those days the law said that you could not own a newspaper, a television station, and a commercial radio station in the same town all at the same time. And they decided to keep WTOP, right? Correct. And they got rid of? WTOP FM. M, which became? WHUR, Howard University yeah. Radio. They sold it to Howard University for the princely sum of one dollar. <laughs> and that was how Howard University Radio came into existence. And at that time I was working at a bookstore, the Drum and Spear bookstore, following my ideological <laughs> line. Where was it located? At 1371 Fairmont Street Northwest, yeah. at the corner of 14th and Fairmont Street. You know, the thing is, you know, I'm asking you all these addresses because what your what your career and life in Washington spans is the tremendous transformation of the neighborhoods in which you lived. I mean, it is the story of, you know, for, I, I've lived the same years here that you have, pretty much. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
I, I can remember war-torn 14th Street. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, well, I can remember the riots. Yeah. But uh, it's 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 stunning. And 14th and Fairmont was just about maybe 10, 12 blocks down the street from where Diane Rehm grew up on the corner of 14th and Upshur Streets North. Is this a requirement for working at WAMU? <laughs> but no, it demonstrates how the city has changed yeah. because by the time of the riots in 1968 and after the riots, what was an integrated, first predominantly white and then integrated neighborhood, mm -hmm. become a, became a predominantly black neighborhood by the early 1970s. Where the, that's where the bookstore was located. And, um, and of course, the changes now, I mean, and this brings us into um, what I think a lot of people want to hear us talk about, and that's the incredible week we've just had in Washington. You know, you could say what a, what a difference a week makes or what a difference a guilty plea makes. Yeah. But um, because the last time we, uh, we tried to do this, the mayor's race was just kind of rolling along, not mm -hmm. going anywhere in particular, but it looked like, Gray kind of had it in a walk. Mm -hmm. And now with uh, the Jeffrey Thompson guilty plea on top of other guilty pleas, you know, it's completely changed. Mm -hmm. I was listening um, to uh, your show today. You do your Friday show with uh, Tom Sherwood. Mm -hmm. And your guest was David Catania, who's going to run as an independent. Yep. I don't think I would ever want to be the guest on a Friday between you and Tom Sherwood. You're like two Jack Russells. <laughs> <laughs> and I've listened to your Friday show a number mm. of times now. You two go at it. You have a good time, don't you? We do have a good time because on I the one... I think he's cracking you up most of the time, too, at least. That's he is. He's just a curmudgeon. Um, <laughs> <laughs> on the one hand, we want to make sure that public officials elected and appointed are held accountable. On the other hand, we don't want to take either politicians or ourselves too seriously. Right. Well, David Catania today was taking himself very seriously. I think because David Catania has something to prove. Yeah. David Catania has to prove that he is no longer the volatile, mm -hmm. temper tantrum throwing, yeah. well. um, aggressive legislator that he had the reputation of he being. Sounded, he reminded me of what uh, Jerry Seinfeld used to call a fast talker, you know, because <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. he was trying to get so many words in edgewise between you two. I want to I want to read a, um, the Washington Post today had a lot about our city and its state and the race and everything, but I was struck in particular by a quote from Isaac Fullwood, who used to be Ike. Yep, yeah. the chief of police, who's resident of Ward 7, and he was interviewed, you know, as a resident, and he, and I wish this were my question, but it's his, and I give him full credit, and he was just asking the reporter from the Washington Post, did we create a culture of corruption in the D.C. government? And I wondered what you thought of that, because it seemed really to be spot on what a lot of people are. Well, oh, I think the answer that, to that would be unequivocally yes. I think, by the way, you know, Ike, Ike Fullwood was the most popular police chief DC had until Kathy Lanier. Yeah, who, who I just happened to see last night, and she had been on your show. I mean, there's so many, there's this one degree of separation here. All of those 13 people who are yeah. currently running for yeah. mayor yeah. would be quaking in their if boots she were running. if Kathy Lanier <laughs> decided yeah. to run. No, for you, two had, you two had a great uh, community show. I mean, you're, you're a good. Yeah, you're right, and I sh I gather she just really had sincerely no interest in it. In no, running for mayor. no, she doesn't. I she don't doesn't even think it. she's gaming us, but no, she doesn't. But, but I do think we have created a culture of corruption. Mm -hmm. We've created a culture of corruption by dint of the kind of play, pay to play sc schemes that we have allowed in our city, mm -hmm. where there is not a great deal of transparency about who gives money to whom. We've created a culture of corruption by allowing people to pass on elected positions to people who were better known for what their parents did than for what they did. Yeah, yeah. Um, we've but passed. Who's to, who's to blame, though? Um, you know, is it the voters? I, you know, we have some complicity in this. You know, if we if we elect these people with whatever their record might be, I mean, how do we break this cycle of? making it okay here, seemingly okay here? Let's talk race. Yeah. Because once the city was, as Eleanor Holmes Norton says, the city I grew up in was predominantly white. 
And once we were able to get home rule and beginning to elect our own elected officials, people in the African American community thought it was very important to elect people who looked like us, mm -hmm. to elect people who understood our interests. And I think that was a good thing. I think even the white community agreed. I think so, because remember when Marion Barry ran for mayor, mm -hmm. one of the reasons he won was because the Washington mm -hmm. Post endorsed him three, four, or five times, mm -hmm. and he won the majority of votes in War Three mm -hmm. in that first election when he ran. However, one of our problems became race. I think because so many people felt it was important to have African-American elected Regardless. officials, we were prepared very often to overlook mm -hmm. their stumbles, mm -hmm. to overlook the and that wasn't evidence just of DC. That, that was many of the cities that were electing black leaders. You know, that was that was the story of the last century. Mike Royko writing in Chicago after they started electing African Americans to the state legislature and these people got found with their hands in the till, Mike Royko wrote a famous column in which they said you're new at this stuff. You don't know how to steal and cover it up yet. After a while, you'll begin to learn, just like the rest of Chicago lawmakers, how to cover it up. Well, yeah. yeah. No, I, yeah, I mean, and here we are, and we have two white people running for mayor, and uh, uh, white men, and um, uh, you hear, you know, there's so many discussions. I, I, you know, should we just try having, you know, showing that we can elect, that, that we're colorblind, you know, that it doesn't matter. I don't know that we're there yet. But this election seems to me to be a real test, a real measure of who we are at this point in this century, you know? You know, given or putting aside for one second the uniqueness of DC, because every place is in its own way unique, mm -hmm. the fact of the matter is Duval Patrick is the governor of Massachusetts. He didn't win on the basis of a majority black vote. Right. Barack Obama's president of the United yeah, States. He exactly. didn't win on the basis of a majority black mm -hmm. vote. The notion that the ethnic majority in any single population should be the deciding factor in who gets to be mayor mm -hmm. is a notion that may have had significant currency in the 1960s, in the 1970s, in the 1980s. In Washington, D.C., it doesn't have a great deal of currency any longer. We have had a number of white citywide elected officials yeah. who have served this city very, very well. Mm -hmm. And so I think that among older voters, those of us who remember the 60s and the 70s, it's still really important. Mm -hmm. I think among younger voters, it's, those it's, who have lived through the changes in the city, right. it's not that important. Even looking at the interviews that have been conducted that I've been seeing on television asking people, do you think it's important to have a black mayor? Most of the younger people who are interviewed of either race say, no, that's not important. What's important is to have a mayor who, A, is clean and ethical, and B, mm -hmm. one who can run the city. Really run the city. And, and we three, don't have to like him. And, and three, because I think Vincent Gray can run the city, mm -hmm. but three, one who has a vision for what the city can become. So I, I really don't think it's going to be much of an issue for much longer. Have you, you mentioned Obama. Have you ever wondered what it would have been like to be a young man, say a teenager today, a young black man, and to take for granted um, having a black president of the United States? No, I've never wondered that. <laughs> <laughs> I do. <laughs> because I, I, I often think that the younger blacks are not as conscious of how important that is. Well, this is my point, that to have that be something that you just didn't see as, as this mountain that had to be climbed, that it was, we're there. Where do we go from here? You know, I think that for my generation, you, hear, you heard a lot of people saying, I never thought I'd live to see the day when this was happening. That was not my sentiment. I always thought I would live to see the mm -hmm. day when that happened, because having come from a culture in which the British first ruled, and then seeing the transition in that culture from British rule to quote unquote native rule, I knew that people of color mm -hmm. 
-hmm. could administer governments and run countries, yeah, yeah. and that people of of other colors, white people who lived there, could live in that country. And women so, too. And women. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Matter of fact, we saw that a long time ago in Israel. But I never thought that I wouldn't see that in my lifetime. But I realized that for my generation, my own thinking was fairly unusual. Mm -hmm. But in my children's generation, they don't necessarily see it as being that significant. Um, so we'll, we'll see what happens. Uh, what do you hear from your listeners um, of this week? What were you hearing uh, in the aftermath of the Thompson plea? I mean, do you, do you hear confusion? Do you hear, uh, let me put it this way. When, in the election when Adrian Fenty lost, it seemed to me that election, the mood was defined by anger, anger toward Adrian Fenty. Mm -hmm. How do you see the mood this week as we go ever closer to the primary day? I'll go back to what we've been hearing from our listeners. What we've been hearing from our listeners is that Jeff Thompson's guilty plea and his assertion that Vincent Gray knew of his shadow campaign has confirmed in the minds of a lot of our listeners that the mayor was not telling the truth. That's what most of what we've been hearing from our listeners so far. Mm -hmm. But what I've been reading from Mark Fisher in the Washington mm -hmm. Post and others is that that is not necessarily a citywide sentiment. But it is the sentiment that we've been getting most from our listeners. And as you know, the current newspapers have decided to change their mind about their endorsement of Vincent Gray. Yeah, that Gray. was interesting. And that's likely to change some minds also. I was um, going to ask you that. How important are endorsements in Washington at this stage? Not as important as they used to be, because most of our uh, voters do not necessarily get their information from the same sources Do anymore. you endorse? No, I never endorse. Yeah. I never endorse. I never take a position. And I almost never know who I'm voting for until I actually get, get into there. the voting booth. Well. And that's kind of where I Do am Do you right think now. we should have an open primary? Yes. Do you think it could ever happen? No. So, you know. <laughs> well, <laughs> I think that once our, once our legislature is dominated by members of one party, and this is why, getting back to why Tom and I don't take ourselves or politicians too seriously, because I think that once our legislature is dominated by members of one party, regardless of what they say their interest is in the entire city, mm -hmm. you have to understand that their primary interest, the primary interest of all politicians, is in being reelected. Yeah. And therefore, you want the, 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 the landscape, the political landscape, mm -hmm. to be what favors your reelection. So it is unrealistic of us to expect a predominantly democratic body, even though, to her credit, Mary Che has yeah said essentially that she's in favor of open primaries. Mm -hmm. um, it's always easier to say that if you know you're going to be in the minority. That the majority is going to go you have against. Cover. You, you, you got cover. But the majority is, is going to go against that. I think if we had open primaries, more people in this city would feel invested in mm -hmm. the future of the city. Did, did you question Machen's timing on this deal? Oh, um, hell yes. Because didn't, <laughs> didn't the Attorney General say that uh, prosecutors should be mindful to not bring actions uh, that affect elections just before the elections are going to happen, or something, something like that? Yeah, and but this I, seems to me to be timed entirely to affect the election. I questioned it, but I eventually came down on the side of Machen because the Justice Department regulations also say that you have to pursue investigations and you cannot... Sort of with blinders on? You cannot delay yeah. conclusions so per, because of an election is coming. So out. perhaps it was really controlled by Bob Bennett and Brendan Sullivan, who were the lawyers for Gray and, uh, and Jeffrey Thompson. And who, frankly, I think Machen is very apprehensive about because Brendan Sullivan was the attorney that the Justice Department had a verdict overturned on with the senator from... Yeah, Ted Stevens. Ted Stevens, right. with Senator Ted Stevens. So with, and then they know they're coming up against two attorneys, Brendan Sullivan and, and Robert Bennett, who would rather go to court. Mm -hmm. And so I well, think one of the reasons... They're going to certainly want you to think that. Yes, and that's one of the reasons I think it took the U.S. Attorney Ron Machen such a long time 
before he approached um, Jeffrey Thompson because yeah. he wanted to make sure that Brendan Sullivan would not have to confront him in court. And so he gathered a great deal of evidence. It is why I think so many people in the media who, who offer opinions are going with Machen on whether or not Gray is A, going to be indicted, and whether or not B, Machen can prosecute mm -hmm. him. Because what Machen has shown is a degree of diligence that suggests that if he says that the mayor knew about this, that he probably is accumulating other evidence mm -hmm. on paper. Because what he has shown so far, Robert Bennett, in my opinion, would destroy in court. Because if you're depending exclusively on the words of convicted felons who have all struck plea deals to get shorter sentences, right. then I think Robert Bennett would destroy them. So everybody who knows Machen seems to think that he has more or he'll be collecting more. Is there potentially a silver lining in the timing of this uh, plea deal in so far as it might energize people to go to the polls? Because the last figure I heard was that the expected turnout was about 100,000 and change and that whoever won the Democratic primary could probably win with 30,000 votes or thereabouts, oh. which just struck me as appalling. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You'd like to think in uh, our city, in the nation's capital, we could elect our mayor with, you know, more than 30,000 votes. But do you think it will have the effect of bringing more people to the polls or keeping them away from voting and just writing it off? I have no idea. <laughs> I do not know. I just wondered if you... I have no idea, but, but I am happy that you can find a silver lining. Well, because I'm, I'm, I am I'm using words. The only silver lining I can find is sitting right in this room with us. The reason I live in Washington, the reason I love Washington, mm -hmm. is because of the people who live in Washington. Mm -hmm. And so for me, because right now, we are in such a rut. We have had so many members of our legislature who have been either convicted right. of or caught up in ongoing criminal enterprises that it's killing a reputation nationwide yeah. that was already suffering. And I was telling you. <laughs> and so, you know, even though the last three governors of Illinois are in jail, I know, well, yeah, <laughs> I know, but I know. they're not in the news, okay? Yeah. We are in the news right now, and what you're seeing in the news is a succession of officials going to jail, yeah. and that, that It brings sullies. back all the old juju, you know? It's like, it's all Mary and Barry over again. That we're just never out of that, out of that tailwind that was started then, and... And for those of us, frankly, who are interested in voting rights and ultimately statehood, every time it comes up, you get these people who say this, and you say, yeah, but look at Illinois, yeah, look at New Jersey, and people say, well, we're not talking about them, we're talking about you. But I would even say for you, Kojo, um, because I listen to your show, I would say that you, I would expect, feel a frustration that the election has become about this and not about the other issues you would like it to be about. Well, the other issues I would like it to be about has to do with a real difference in opinion around the city about how the city is developing. There are all of the benefits that we're getting from the new construction and the restaurants and the theaters. Sports. Sports, all of, all of it. But there is still a significant portion of the population that feels left out, mm -hmm. that feels as if it is not being included in this. Or that losing. Its education has mm -hmm. not prepared it for, the, for, for this. The pricing of housing is going up, and people cannot figure out how to afford housing. Um, so that's the discussion we should be having. People who lived here their whole lives leave for what you call Ward 9 for Prince George's County. And Except for this. There are people who can no longer afford to live in the city right. and move to Prince George's County, but there's another side of that coin. Prince George's County is the most affluent African-American county in the nation. Mm -hmm. And just about all of the people I talk to who live in Prince George's mm -hmm. County love living in Prince George's County. Could you live in Prince I George's hear, County? No, no, okay. I, <laughs> no. I hear very few people who live in Prince George's County who say, except for one of my sons, I hate the idea 
that I can't live in the district anymore. <laughs> they like where they yeah. live. They don't see themselves as being in Ward 9 of the district. They see themselves as being in a great place to live that's developing and which crime is dropping. And they have statehood. They have a vote they that counts vote. in the Congress of the United States. Yes, yes. indeed. Well, you know. Um, uh, I brought up sports, which takes me just in a completely, I have, I have two sports areas I want to talk to you about. One, I want to talk to you about the team name. Do you use the team name? I do. You do. And do you think it should be changed? I do. And how do you think that can happen? I think that ultimately it will happen. I think that what we've been seeing over the past decade is a mushrooming opinion against the name of the team. I think for many years, I for one, and I'm a hometown rooter, I root mm -hmm. for all of the home teams, and so for many years, I, I rooted for the team and, and never gave much thought to the name. Um, even though I have known Suzanne Harjo, the woman who first brought the mm -hmm. suit against the Redskins in the late 1960s, I've known her ever since I've been in broadcasting in 1973 is when I started in Brosk, and I've known her since then, interviewed her several times, mm -hmm. then I would forget about it. Yeah, well, we all get our consciousness raised in different ways, you know. So I never gave it much thought, but over the course of the past three or four years, as more and more people have weighed in on it, and I've been, as a result, forced to think about it a lot more, I think that it would obviously be both the right thing to do, and it would get rid of a lot of the rancor that surrounds the team, and frankly, I think ultimately the team would be able to make more money if it got rid of the I, name because yeah. it will be able to sell new paraphernalia and the old paraphernalia. I, that's exactly my <laughs> argument. I figure, they're having, I figure they're having secret meetings in a soundproof chamber <laughs> where they're just figuring out the marketing when? plan. Yes. Yeah, you know, just how do we do this? Mm -hmm. And of course there's another padded room where they are conditioning Dan Snyder to accept it. But, yeah. <laughs> but another football uh, issue I wanted to talk to you about, and it extends beyond football, but the NFL, there's been talk about uh, penalties for using the n-word on the field and it, it, it do you think that can even happen first of all do you think that's even a, a oh I think it can happen it can happen yeah I think it can happen so then my question would be how does it shouldn't it then not also happen in music and and rap and hip-hop and all other music and entertainment should there not just be a, a general public attitude that it's not okay for anybody to use this word yes how does that happen? It won't. Um, okay. Well, if I, it happens I, in the NFL, couldn't that be a beginning? It could be a beginning, but I think I don't use the word anymore. And there was a time when I used the word in what a lot of people argue is a loving, familiar way, the way it's used in the African-American community. I used to make that argument before also in the same way that a lot of women lovingly refer to other women using the B word. Yeah, but um, there are a few other words we don't use that are more comparable to the exactly. N-word. But it became apparent to me at a, at a certain point that trying to make fine distinctions between how one group of people use the word and how another group of people mm -hmm. use the word was pointless. Because mm -hmm. in the final analysis, we live in a country in which there are a wide variety of people. And to suggest mm -hmm. that in this wide variety of people, you can single out one group of people for whom it was okay to use the word, and if anybody else used the word, it was not appropriate, mm -hmm. seems to me to be a bit too intellectually demanding for 300 million yeah. people to try to understand. Yeah, yeah. 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 Well, so you, you, think, you think this will happen, and you think that uh, the NFL... I think it's going to happen in the NFL. I don't think because of the way language evolves, it's going to happen in general um, in my lifetime. Well, shouldn't people like Jay-Z and whatever Diddy or Daddy is calling himself <laughs> these days, but, you know, just wouldn't it be good if they, too, made, made a, a play on this and took a position and urged? It, it's funny, you know, because those artists are not who we think they are. They're artists. Many of those artists, Jay-Z may be an mm -hmm. exception because he does say that he sold drugs, etc. A lot of those artists come from middle class families. <laughs> <Yeah. had laughs> Went to St. Albans. Exactly right. 
and then they reinvent themselves as these streetwise yeah. kind of people. And so I think we're talking about an industry in which a great deal of money is made by the use of those words, by the creation of those images. That's not going to go away for a very long time because in the final analysis we live in a very assertive and aggressive capitalist society and you're talking about a, a something that is a source of great wealth for very large numbers yeah. of people yeah. well, and so that's all comes down to money always, exactly right it? that's not going to stop um you were born rex orville montague paul yeah my parents got a little carried away and it's a lovely name actually it does sound shakespearean actually my father was the only person in our neighborhood who knew that rex meant king in latin everybody else felt it was a dog name <laughs> but, but and, I, and i wanted to end on your brother because i think it's very moving and very sad and i'm sure you're still healing but there was something that you wrote uh, on your Facebook page because your brother's last name was Paul and you wrote um, my beloved older brother Hugh Bonnie Paul identified in an article you were referring to as a taxi driver was not he was a retired civil servant and he was killed while walking in his neighborhood on the street where he lived I'll be going to prepare a place for him but his place in my heart and in my life is forever secure this was last year and your brother was murdered how are you doing and tell I, us about him. I bat left-handed even though I'm right-handed because my older brother was left-handed. As a kid you run around behind your older sibling and you do everything the way he does it. And so of course when I say batting I'm not talking baseball I'm talking cricket because that right. was the game we played in British Guiana. But I followed my brother not only in the childish games that we played, but it was my brother who led to my intellectual awakening. You know, there, I think it was um, the writer Dinesh D'Souza mm -hmm. who wrote that Barack Obama was pursuing the anti colonial vision of his father who he never knew. No, that was me. Mm -hmm. I was pursuing the anti-colonial vision of my brother mm -hmm. because my parents were raised in a colonial society and like many people of their generation felt that that was appropriate. It was a good way to live. My older brother who was 74 when he died was the one who in high school started joining with others against British colonial rule in their teenage years and listening to him and his friends and my parents also had a circle of friends who argued politics a lot but they were not quite as forward looking if mm -hmm. you will as my brother and his friends. My brother actually left home at one point and lived in a coffee house uh, where he and his friends argued politics all day long <laughs> and I would go over there and I would be fascinated by what they were reading it was through my brother that I read James Baldwin. And so he is the one who opened my eyes intellectually to what the rest of the world was all about. But my brother suffered with mental illness oh, I didn't know. all his life, ever since he was about 19 years old. And so he was retired from the civil service in his mid-30s after his fifth or sixth <coughs> nervous breakdown. Uh -huh. And so my sister and I contributed to his support and went to see him often. And he came and spent time with us here from time to Did time. Did you ever have him on your show? No, but he, whenever he was around, he would make himself a complete nuisance <laughs> around the radio station. But we joked that he lived life in London because we were supporting him. <laughs> and he was retired. And, and he was, after his last nervous breakdown, which was in the early in about 2000, 3004 mm -hmm. for the past 10 years. He was stable, he was well, and he was a very friendly person and just walked around the city of Georgetown <coughs> where his Georgetown. he knew everybody and mm -hmm. everybody liked him. So the thing that, that hurt for me the most was that at his funeral a woman shouted, and even though he was in his 70s and he was still called Bunny, the nickname that he had as an infant. <laughs> a woman shouted at his funeral and she said, 
Without Bunny, how are we going to know that it's Easter? How are we going to know that it's Christmas? How are we? Because he went around to everybody's homes on those holidays to just share a little cheer with them mm -hmm. because that was his life. He was completely harmless. All he liked doing was socializing with yeah. people. And then he was walking down the street one day and a crazed man on drugs and alcohol walked out of a building with a gun and shot him, two other civilians, and two police officers dead. I'm so, so sorry. Yeah, that's... But how are your parents? Or My parents are both dead. Yeah. Um, yeah. I have an older think sister and a younger brother. Think of you, obviously, as being yeah. only about 35. Yeah, so. right. I have an older sister and a younger brother. And as I said, he lives in our hearts. We tell a lot of stories about him. Well, it's clear to me in listening to him, um, you talk about him, um, and you talk about his role in the community. Yeah, well, you've, yeah. you know, you, you, you've got that too. Your, your parents did very well. I mean, what, wherever it came from, you, it's obviously in your DNA. Let me tell you quickly about the two Georgetowns. It was about 15 or 20 yeah, years minute. ago <laughs> when I was coming back from Guyana on uh -huh. a plane, and as the plane circled, I looked down on Georgetown and I said, home at last. This is my Georgetown This is now. your Georgetown. Right. So this is home. Well, we, yeah. we, we love having you here. Yes. It's been wonderful talking to you. Um, I hope you'll come back again. Yes. And we got through this whole, oh, I'm sorry. I was going to say we got through this whole show with no calamity, but it was just a door closing. Thanks. Nothing blew up. But thank you very much, Kojo. Thank you Good so luck much. to you. Good luck to us all. Thank you for having me. I have admired your work for years and was looking forward to being invited on this broadcast. Thank you. Very good. So thank all of you. Thank and you. here we are back in the saloon. Have a good day. Please, please keep watching.